Number 1 This happened a while ago, when I had moved into my own place for the first time. My parents had let me money for a place, so I decided to move into a duplex-type house by myself. Anyway, after about a month of living there, I had gotten settled in and become quite friendly with my neighbors. One morning, I went to the mailbox to get bills and stuff, and I noticed that someone had broken it open. The metal lock on the back looked like it was shimmied off or something like that. I looked inside, and mail was there, but it was all opened and put back in their ripped envelopes. At the time, I didn't think much of it, and I was just pissed off. Jump forward a few days, and it's early in the morning. I had got up and was about to go to work. I opened my door to walk to my car, and I realized I had forgotten my tablet. I walked back inside, leaving my front door wide open. I walked back to the front door to see a man in a hoodie standing outside by the door. I dropped my stuff and let out a little squealing sound. I was more surprised than scared. He was outside my door at this point. All I could think to say was hi. He didn't say anything. I picked up my stuff and walked towards the door to speak to him when I saw he was holding a black flip knife in his hand. I screamed as loud as I could and ran into my house, not looking back. I ran to the bathroom directly down the main hall of the house and locked myself in. It was a sliding door. I curled up on the floor and listened. I could hear him walking down my hallway. I just continued to scream as loud as I could. Here's the great thing about living in a duplex. My neighbors were a married couple in their early 60s who at the time were sitting down for breakfast. I didn't know at the time, but the husband was an ex-police officer. Yay! I'll switch over to what happened through the eyes of my neighbor from what I heard and what they tell me. I'll call the ex-cop, Bill. They were eating breakfast when they faintly heard me scream the first time when I saw him at the door. When I started screaming at the top of my lungs, Bill obviously thought something was wrong. He stuffed his gun under his belt just in case. You can see the bathroom from my front door, and remember that the front door is wide open. Bill arrived at my front door to see the guy with the knife in his hand, and his face pressed up against the bathroom door. Bill draws his gun and screams, I don't know who the fuck you are, but drop the fucking knife. I hear this through the door, and I immediately feel a sense of relief, but also of adrenaline. Now this is where I say that I tell you that until you've heard gunshots in a confined space, you do not realize how loud they are. Apparently the guy didn't take the hint from Bill, and ran at him with the knife. Three deafening shots rang out. Stay in there for the time being. I recognized the voice immediately as Bill's. I was never more relieved in my life. Long story short, Bill got three near-perfect shots on the guy's shoulder, enough to stop him in his tracks. The police came within minutes and took the guy away in an ambulance. Apparently, he had been watching my house ever since I moved in and was a prior sex offender. So, if it was not for my neighbors, I probably wouldn't be writing this right now. Sorry this was so long. Number 2 The following is a story of poor teenage decision-making. Our actions were questionable, but I can't change that now. I grew up in a shitty desert valley in Southern California, a great place to be from, which consisted mostly of an aviation industry and a mall. By the time my friends and I were 16, 2003-ish, we came to the conclusion that where we lived sucked and resorted to making our own fun. One such activity was exploring some tunnels that ran through the city. This tunnel was a part of the aqueduct and was mostly uncovered except for one section about one and a half to two miles long. The ceiling was about 20 feet above, 
and there was a wall in the center, splitting the tunnel into two parallel tunnels about 60 feet wide with no way to get to the other side once you were inside. Also, about halfway through the tunnel, there was a curve, so from either end, you could not see the other opposing exit. Even during the day, once inside, a flashlight barely did anything. I could barely light up my shoes, it seemed. It was fun to take fireworks inside and watch the glow. On occasion, we saw homeless people down one side of the tunnel, so we would walk down the other way so we didn't disturb them, and we'd still get to have our fun. This day, or night rather, we took some paintball guns with us. Our idea was to go deep in the tunnel, turn off our flashlights, and shoot at each other. Fuck yeah! We took two cars because six of us were going to partake in the showdown, and we parked our cars near one of the tunnel openings where they couldn't be seen from the street and pointing cops to the obvious location of teenage shenanigans. As we walked down the slope to the entrance, we suddenly felt like we dropped into Silent Hill. About 20 feet away, right next to the right opening, was a girl about our age sitting down on the ground with her head down, arms wrapped around her knees. We asked if she was okay, and we received no response. We looked down the right tunnel to see a small fire way down the tunnel, and the silhouette of a man walking in ours in the girl's direction. We figured this girl wouldn't talk to us, and that the person coming knew her and would talk to her. It wasn't our problem, so we headed our merry asses to the left tunnel. Now, there is a reason I have the friends I do. They are good people. Shortly after entering the tunnel, we felt like something wasn't right. We hadn't ventured too far in and thought it best to just leave. One friend said we should go to Subway and come back with a sandwich for this girl. We try to talk to her again as we pass, but still no response. The person we had seen walking our direction previously was about 100 feet away from us now. We walk up the slope to our cars, and as we're getting in, one friend points out that the person that was walking out, which we can now hear as a man, is yelling at the girl. He's calling her names that no 16-year-old girl should be called. We begin to walk back and hear what sounded like the girl being slapped and her crying out in pain. When he was finally in view, he looked up at us, saying that we needed to leave. Things are obviously tense. This dude clearly doesn't mind hitting people, and there are six of us standing there with loaded paintball guns. This girl's mental abacus must have been sliding beads back and forth, because she came to a realization she didn't want to be there anymore and took off running towards some nearby apartments. The man began yelling at her to come back, but she wasn't having it. He began talking shit about her again, when one friend told him to shut the fuck up and that he shouldn't hit women, and especially young girls. Now, we were the focus of his anger. There is also another reason I have the friends I do. We think alike. So when this man suddenly decided to pick up a large rock to throw at us, we all began firing our paintball guns. We didn't have them pumped up to where they left bruises, but I'm sure getting hit at six times the rate was not pleasant. He tried running toward us, but quickly slipped and fell, which prompted us to stop firing and run back to the cars. We didn't see the girl anywhere in sight, and by the time the cars were started up and pulling away, the guy had just made it to the top of the slope. We pulled out of there feeling victorious, but quickly realized there was a random, presumably homeless girl running scared with nowhere to go. We rounded back towards the area she ran to and searched for about 30 minutes without seeing her, and headed back to one of our friend's houses. Thinking back, had we actually found the girl later, she would have probably been mortified. What was seemingly a good intent on our behalf was probably terrifying to her, thinking we were tracking her down. I hope she found a safe place that night, and is in a better position than she was when we first saw her. For the asshole that hit her, I hope he never saw her again. We never went back to those tunnels after that night.
number three. Five years ago, I lived in a small apartment that I loved so much. I was a 22-year-old girl, living alone and starting with my grown-up life. I worked in a newspaper, and I was very happy. One weekend, a friend from another town came to visit. After having some food, we went to my place. He parked his van in the open garage, and I went to my house while he took all his stuff from the van. I was in the living room, waiting for him, when I heard screams. I rushed out to see what was happening, and I saw my neighbor with a metal tube running behind my friend. When the neighbor saw me, he stopped and my friend rushed to my apartment. I asked him what happened, and he said that this guy came out of the blue with the tube to chase him. I should tell you here that this neighbor was the brother of my landlord. We thought that he must be drunk and thought my friend was a burglar or something. Nothing more happened in that weekend. Some months later, another friend came to pick me up. When we were taking his car out of the garage, the same neighbor came out of his house, running, and kicked the car very hard. My friend stepped out of the car and asked what that was all about. The neighbor was really, really angry. He was a big, tall, strong dude, and approached my friend in a very aggressive way. I stepped out of the car, and with all the adrenaline, I made this nonsense that was stepping in the middle of them. What's your problem? I asked, and the guy calmed down a little. My friend told me to get back in the car, and I did. He did the same. We were overwhelmed with the whole thing. When we got back to my home, he was outside the garage, hanging out with his brother, the landlord. I asked my landlord if we can have a word with him, and we told him what his brother has done. My landlord was very ashamed and asked his brother to come and clear things up with us. I talked to this sicko, and he told me that he went mad because my friend drove the car too fast in the garage, and he had messed up some rocks out of the ground. I told him that everything that bothers him from my visits in the future should be arranged with me, talking like people. He apologized and agreed. Everything went normal until that December. Saturday the 18th, I was with a very bad flu and feeling terrible, so I took this super strong medicine that knocked me out. I fell asleep early and didn't wake up until the next morning. When I woke up, I looked for my cell phone in my night table and didn't find it there. I thought I left it in the living room, so I looked for a small laptop that I had in a drawer next to my bed. Nothing. Then I went to my living room and noticed that all the windows were opened and everything was messy. My other computer, the one that I used for personal things, was also missing, and my camera too. I ran to a friend's house who lived near my home and asked her for her phone. Then I called my parents, not so grown up, you see, and the police. The police in my country suck, so there was nothing they could do. My parents told me that, if I was feeling insecure, they will gladly lend me some money to pay for the deposit of a new place. I really loved my house, so I told them that it wasn't necessary. On Monday, I reinforced the windows and changed the lock of the door. I wasn't really nervous because I lived in a small town full of students and the burglaries were more or less common in late December when everyone was out of town with their family. Bad luck, I thought, and keep going. The night of December 23rd, everything was calm and quiet when I went back from work. I opened the main door of the building and the first thing I saw is the sicko neighbor. I walked fast trying to avoid him but then, he called me by my name, I had never told him my name, and ran by my side. He started to ask some strange questions and talk nonsense. 
He asked me if I would ever paint a picture of his dog smoking weed, or if I remembered what I was wearing when I came to see the apartment for the first time. Then he told me something that really chilled my bones. You look more like your mother than like your father. Click. This was the guy who entered my apartment. He has been looking at my pictures and my stuff. He knows everything about me. I freaked out and rushed to the stairs, but he grabbed my arm and pulled me to a corner. And that moment, thank God, we heard the sound of a car parking in the garage. He released me, and I run as fast as I can to my apartment. I locked myself in, called the police, but again, nothing. It seems that this guy needed to do something visible to me for the police to take action, so I grabbed a hammer and a knife and didn't sleep at all during the night. The next morning, I did two things. Asked a friend if I could stay with her that week, and called my parents and tell them that I would take the money and look for another place to live. Wednesday next week, I was moving into my new house. You creepy sicko neighbor, let's never, ever meet again. Number 4 Hey Reddit, long time lurker, new poster. For some brief background, I'm an 18 year old male, and this encounter occurred when I was around 13. Every year, when the 4th of July rolls around, me and my family would go to a friend's house to celebrate. The friend and his family are quite wealthy, and they live in a large house about half a mile into the woods. The 4th of July parties at their house were always huge events with around 15 to 20 families attending. The younger people at the parties were either around my age or high school age. I typically hung out with my friend Gavin and his sister Trina, who I had a huge crush on at the time, who were the kids of the family that owned the house. On this particular 4th of July, the older kids decided they wanted to go out into the woods, and of course, all the younger kids wanted to go too, me included. Keith, one of the older kids, agreed to us tagging along under the condition that we couldn't chicken out or run away. All of the younger kids agreed, and the whole group journeyed into the woods. Keith was leading us down a trail to a nearby pond when Trina grabbed my hand. Thirteen-year-old me turned beet red in the darkness, but I could also tell something was wrong. There's something in the woods. I just saw him. He's a big man. She pointed out into the trees, but I didn't see anything. I squeezed her hand tightly and told her that she was just seeing things. Trina had always been the sort to scare easily, and I thought nothing of it. The group finally made it to the pond. We only had one flashlight with us, but by this time, everyone's eyes had adjusted to the blackness of the woods. We all sat around talking and goofing off. We occasionally heard sounds out in the woods, but we just figured it was the local deer population. Most of us are children of deer hunters, and the area was near our dad's hunting land. Eventually, everyone settled down, and Keith started telling us a scary story. It was something about kids getting lost in the woods. Nice one, Keith. As the story continued, Trina's grip on my hand got tighter and tighter. She was practically shaking when one of Keith's friends tossed a log into the pond right at the story's climax. Everyone jumped and screamed, and eventually we all started laughing at how scared we got. Suddenly, another distinct laugh joined ours. It was a deep, throaty chuckle that echoed off the empty space around the pond. We all stopped laughing and sat in silence. I looked around, and my eyes locked onto a large black mass that could only be human standing at the edge of the woods around the pond. That was a good one. You even startled me, said the mass. The voice sounded similar to the chuckle from before. The air seemed to freeze, and for what seemed like eternity, no one moved. I felt like Trina was trying to shatter the bones in my hand. Suddenly, as if time had started again, we all scrambled up and ran. We ran as fast and as hard as we could, 
but it didn't seem fast enough. I could hear the heavy footfalls behind our group, heavier than any of us could produce. The man was following us. After what seemed like hours, we all exited the woods and ran into the brightly lit driveway. We watched the edge of the woods while Keith did a head count. Trina swears to this day that she saw the man standing at the edge of the woods, watching us, before turning back and walking away. This remains one of the scariest experiences in my life. I like to tell myself that the man was just passing by and had no ill intentions, but why did he chase after us? If he was the one who Trina saw on the way to the pond, why did he follow us there? I'll never know his intentions or why he was there. So chuckling creepsmen, let's not meet again. Number 5 This happened to me and my husband roughly about 8 to 9 years ago. It was near to Christmas time, and we were desperate for jobs, as we had a baby and needed an income urgently. We sat down to look at the job vacancies page in the newspaper, and I spotted a small ad for a marketing company that were looking for call center agents and warehouse workers. Perfect, as I had experience of working in call centers, and my husband wanted a change of job, and rather than working in a kitchen, he was excited at the prospect of working in a warehouse. I called for an interview, and also explained that my husband is also interested in getting an interview for the warehouse position. We were given an interview time and the address of the place we would be working at. On the day of the interview, we arrived on time and found ourselves stood in a sparsely decorated waiting room. It looked as though they had made a trip to Ikea and chose a few pieces of modern furniture, i.e. leather chairs and tall vases, and quickly assembled it without actual care of where they were positioning the furniture items. In this same room, there was also a brown door which led into the interview office. We were handed a clipboard with a form attached by the receptionist slash PA. I think it was just standard questions you would answer on any job application form. We were not the only interviewees in attendance that day. In total, myself and my husband included, there were five people. Those that had been interviewed were asked to wait once again in the waiting area, and eventually, it was our turn to be interviewed. We went into the office together, and what struck me was the actual size of this office. It was more or less a glorified cleaning cupboard with just enough room for the desk and three chairs. The walls looked as though they had hastily been painted white, with patches of the old eggshell paint still showing in places. The guy that was interviewing us looked a bit like Patrick Bateman from the awesome film American Psycho, except I would say this guy was in his early 40s. The interview was going well, and he seemed overly confident, which unsettled me a little. He explained we could be making 70,000 euro a year, and then if we make it to manager level, we could be making 170,000 euro a year. He started telling us about all the holidays he had been on, and the cars he drove because of his excellent wage. This didn't impress me in the slightest, and at that point on, I decided I didn't personally like this guy, but hey ho. Also, I will note that during the interview, he said that only five physicians would be available today, and like the other interviewees, we were sent back to the waiting room to wait. Around 15 minutes later, the interviewer brought us all back in one by one. Me and my husband had to go in separately this time, and lo and behold, we had all gotten the jobs. We were then told we were being split up to work in different teams, and I was sent to two guys who were dressed in suit pants and shirts. My husband and another male interviewee was hustled out of the room by two different guys, and I remember catching my husband's eye trying to mentally say to him, what the fuck is going on? My husband told me that he asked the two guys that were taking him from the room about the warehouse, and is he going to see it now? They led him and the other interviewee into a dimly lit corridor and left them there to look while they went to go and get things ready. 
They saw fluorescent satchels on the floor and nothing else. Also, they heard the sound of noisy call center-like chatter coming from a side room, and my husband said it sounded so odd that he decided to sneak a peek through the door. He looked into the room to see just some old desks and whiteboards on the wall, and a tape recorder, playing noisy chatter, and obviously to emulate the sound of an actual call center. Upon seeing this, my husband quickly shuts the door, not knowing what to make of it, and the other guy said, fuck this, and left the building straight away. The other two guys returned, and said they were ready and became visibly angry that the other guy had just run off and not stayed in a job that many others wished they had. Anywho, I was teamed up with two guys. One was small and fat with tiny eyes, and the other was tall and average looking with lovely black hair, and from what I remember, he was Irish. They led me outside and into the high street, as we would be traveling somewhere, and they had a fold-up trestle table and two hold-all bags. At this point, I'm wondering where the call center is, so I asked them, and they said that we would be doing sales except it would be outside. My heart sank. They stopped at a Greg's, bakery shop, and asked if I would like some lunch and that they would pay. I declined their offer and bought myself my own drink as I don't know these people and it felt... awkward. We ended up taking two buses, and they paid for my travel expenses. I didn't mind that, as I had no idea we would be traveling anywhere, and they said that it would be covered by the office anyway. It was freezing cold on this particular day, and we ended up outside a large supermarket, where they proceeded to set up a trestle table, and laid in it with crappy, cheap-looking, and boring children's safety toys. Two bike reflectors for 8 euro, and small packs of coloring pencils for 4 euro. I was told to stand a bit back from the table and take notes as they tried and failed at selling anything. One woman did actually comment that it was expensive crap. The guys did talk to me during breaks they had, but they kept telling me how awesome and rewarding this job could be. The fat guy told me that two weeks previous, he was walking around with a suitcase full of cash that he had earned from his job. I had already decided at this point that I didn't want to keep this job, and planned to stay just until the end of the day, as I had no idea how to get back into the city center alone. The Irish guy was overtly nice to me, and was talking to me about his life and asking me things about mine. I was vague, as I am not an open person, and I am very private. They asked if I was ready to work at the table, and I said I wasn't fully ready to try it yet. I had rather the ground swallow me up than do face-to-face -face sales. At the end of the day, I got back to the city center where I was supposed to meet my husband to make our way back home, and he called me to inform me he was stuck in traffic and had been on the outskirts of the city center. I got home and sent a text to the Irish guy, informing him I would not be returning, and he sent quite a few text messages. One I remember is him inviting me to his upcoming wedding. I also had a few missed calls, and then after that, nothing. The next morning, my husband decided to go back, as we were in financial dire straits. He was once again canvassing around on the outskirts of the city and in rough, crime-ridden areas. He was going business to business, trying to sell some exclusive cards that entitled you to a percentage off meals at certain restaurants. It got to about 2 p.m., and he decided he had had enough and wanted out. He faked a phone call on his mobile, telling his teammates he had an emergency and had to go now. They apparently looked quite panicked about this, and made my husband assure them that he would be returning the next day. By the time he had gotten home, he had already had several missed calls and a couple of voicemails from them. During the evening, they rang and rang and rang his mobile, when he didn't pick up, they sent text messages asking if he is coming back tomorrow, and he didn't respond. Also, he got a text or two that came across as quite aggressive, something along the lines of, You're wasting our time. You're walking away from a big opportunity. They called him for five days straight after that, so much so that he had to change his mobile number. 
I have no idea what the true intentions of any of those people or the business were, nor do I have any idea why they would go to such lengths and create a fake call center. Still, to this day, it is one of the most bizarre things that I have had happen to me in a job, and me and my husband still talk about it sometimes and laugh at the absurdity of it all. So creepy, oddball jobs people, let's never meet again.